I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. The Lord said, I have made a covenant with David, my chosen servant. I have sworn this oath to him. I will establish your descendants as kings forever. They will sit on your throne from now until eternity. All heaven will praise your great wonders, Lord. Myriads of angels will praise you for your faithfulness. For who in all of heaven can compare with the Lord? What mightiest angel is anything like the Lord? The highest angelic powers stand in awe of God. He is far more awesome than all who surround his throne. O Lord of O Lord God of heaven's armies, where is there anyone as mighty as you, O Lord? You are entirely faithful. Well, Psalm 89 is the joyful overflow of a grateful heart that's found its security in the love of God. And I think that would describe all of us. It's very easy to sing of God's rescue, as we've just done, when we are assured of his faithful love and we're secure in his arms. What a beautiful thing for us to be able to say as believers. Now, Psalm 89 has more than eight verses, but we've just chosen the first eight to talk about this morning. And in just these first eight verses, his love is celebrated as an unfailing love, as a forever love, an enduring faithful love, and more. And uh, the psalm itself, um, okay, I think I gave you an outline with where you changed the slides. Um, the, the psalm itself was written in a structured way by a chap called Ethan, um, not Jason's son, Ethan, but a member of King David's court who was known for his wisdom. So, I'm sorry, Catherine. And in, this eight, in these eight verses, we have some couplets. In fact, I'd like to talk about these four couplets, and I'd like you to get excited about Psalm 89. Um, and because we find in this first couplet or pair a straight-out praise for the Lord's unfailing love. Uh, listen to it again with me as I read these couplet out. I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. Like, we can go home happy. We could stop now and it would be great, wouldn't it? Uh, God is wonderful. And then we come to the second pair, which take an unexpected turn. Because here, we suddenly dive into the God's word. We suddenly dive into the scriptures. And we're reminded of God's promise to raise up a forever king from among David's descendants. Now, that might be just a bookmark in a history book and a lovely reference for people who go to Bible college. But no, this is about Jesus, right? We want to be excited about Jesus. The Lord said, I have made a covenant with David, my chosen servant. I have sworn this oath to him. I'll establish your descendants as kings forever. They will sit on your throne from now until eternity. Here, surely, is a promise that goes beyond any human king. But here we have a forever king. Clearly, from our perspective, the Lord Jesus. Isn't it wonderful when you read something that's really old, you know, like more than 2,000 years, 3,000 years old, and it's just as relevant as the day it was written. And we celebrate the coming of Jesus into the world and his rescue. And then there's great celebration, celebration not just on earth, but celebration in heaven itself. And the, so the third couplet or pair show us how even the angels rejoice in the Lord. It is God, or more accurately, more accurately Jesus, they are actually praising the one who is God's son, the forever king. It's called an interlude in some translations. All heaven will praise your great wonders, Lord. Myriads of angels will praise you for your faithfulness. For who in all of heaven can compare with the Lord? What mightiest angel 
is anything like the Lord. I hope that sometimes your breath is just taken away by the love of Jesus. And whether it's because of, you know, the undeserved mercy of his rescue of you and me personally, or whether it's because of the breathtaking beauty of his creation, or really a promises that our minds can't even fully comprehend about a resurrection and a new creation. Or is it his character, the actual purity of his love in a world where love seems to be tainted in so many ways? Yes, it's not just earth, but heaven that declare his praises. And then we come to the final couplet of pair number four, which complete this circle of praise as together with the highest angels, we celebrate his glory, his superiority, his might, and especially what? His faithfulness, his faithful love. The highest angelic powers stand in awe of God. He is far more awesome than all who surround his throne. O oh Lord, God of heaven's armies, where is there anyone as mighty as you, O oh Lord? You are entirely faithful. Well, praise the Lord, hey? Isn't it incredible, the goodness of God to us? In fact, I believe that Jason's favourite song is based on this psalm, uh, I Will Sing of Your Love Forever, if you've heard of that one. Um, and surely this is where we want to be, firmly in the love of Christ. It's where we want our friends and family to be, and it's where we want our neighbours to be. So I want to talk today about some people who are in our own backyard. You've seen a hint of it up on the slides behind me. Uh, it's the third in our series on mission, and our focus today will be on how we as a church can support Aboriginal believers. And we think that this as an important aspect of our mission here in Kiraville and, and beyond. And we've just heard, perhaps through our own lens and perhaps from our own frame, that God leaves no one behind, which means he will not leave me behind. He is entirely faithful. That he is faithful to his promises, that Jesus is the true king and saviour of the world, and no matter how small or forgotten we may feel, our mighty Lord will shield us in his love forever. But if we were just to take that back and play it again through the eyes of some of the most vulnerable people in our community as Australians, the same words are true for those who put their trust in Jesus. What a wonderful promise. Yes, it might seem that we're incredibly wealthy, um, that we've got the pathways all worked out for education and the good life, and uh, we've got unending happiness here in Australia, haven't we? Isn't it great? And we really are blessed beyond, you know, beyond comprehension when you start looking around the world, but... Of course, it's not true, and I want to quote Benjamin Franklin, that famous American, who once said, our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Did you get that quote? Did you see it coming? Now, our Bible passage would add one further category to Benjamin's insight, that in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death, taxes, and the unfailing love of Jesus which defeats both sin and death. <laughs> All of us need Jesus. But today we focus on our Indigenous people. We call them Aboriginal peoples because in reality there is not one tribe or people group but many. And um, in some of our other congregations, there will be people who really don't know much about Australia or Aborigines. So I've got some quick facts and I'm going to skip over them really quickly for you here at the nine o'clock congregation because you probably already know this stuff. 60,000 years ago is about when they arrived. Um, there's a special connection to land and identity with their ancestors' tribal locations. You know all that. 35% of them live in big cities, about 45% in smaller towns, about 15% in remote areas around Australia. So our kind of caricature of, you know, the, the people in Alice Springs is actually only 15% um, of, the, of the, the reality of um, our Aboriginal community. Statistically, um, there's poor outcomes, as you know, in health and education, income, jobs, crime, crime life expectancy, a nurture of kids, there's lots of grief. Um, and it really is a heartbreaking scenario. Many people have given their lives to serving the Aboriginal community. Um, 
Another grief uh, is the stolen generation story, uh, describing how a government policy allowed large numbers of children, Aboriginal children, to be taken from their homes and brought up in foster homes and group homes. Of course, behind that is the community was dysfunctional and the kids were going to have bad outcomes, but as a result of a government policy, these kids have lost cultural connection, family connection. Sometimes they've been mistreated in those homes and you know the outcome to that story. There are important dates and anniversaries each year. We see them a particular way. The Aboriginal community, for the most part, um, sometimes see these things in a different way. Australia Day, Day of Sadness, Harmony Week, a week about discrimination, education of our kids. Schools celebrate Harmony Week. Sorry Day, a story of perhaps about reconciliation and hope. Mabo Day, a um, land court case victory. Um, NADOC Week, a celebration of cultures and many more. All right, so that's my little summary of uh, Aboriginal story, um, which I hope will help um, people who don't understand much to know a little bit more. Now, of course, our government and communities have put lots of care, effort into caring for the wider population of Aboriginal people. Um, and I've got an artwork on the screen here by artists um, Kanisha and Zali, chosen for our, does anyone know this? Do you recognise the pattern? It's chosen for our Illawarra Indigenous co um, Corporation. So this is, a, this is a Wollongong thing. And the different parts here, you can find them... I, no, I forgot the street name now. It was Kenny Street, but they moved to somewhere else. Aged care, cultural services, housing, family services, education and employment are the kinds of helps that are offered uh, through this service at the uh, Illawarra Indigenous Corporation. They're a not-for-profit. Um, some of you might even volunteer for groups like this around the community. Um, but like, like the IIC, we at KI Church think it's a great idea to support Aboriginal people, but our appropriate area and our area of strength, of course, is to support those who have become family to us as fellow believers in the Lord Jesus. I hope you're on board with that. And actually, that's a lot of people, our brothers and sisters in Christ among the Aboriginal people. So bear with me some more statistics. Roughly 50 or 60% of Australians identify as Christian. Okay? The numbers change. It's been going down a bit. But amongst Aboriginal people, it's roughly 60 or 70% who identify as Christian. Now, that says two things to me. That says that there's actually a positive legacy from the generations of Christian love that's been extended to Aboriginal people in the past. That a lot of the work, as much as we get criticised in public sphere, a lot of the Christian work that's gone on has actually borne fruit in people's lives and they've been touched by love. And that's an encouragement. But there's another thing there. And um, I'll get to it. But where are all these Aboriginal believers? Where do you find them? There are folk um, who are just part of churches, normal churches all over. We've got a man named Bobby in our 1030 congregation. Um, and he and his kids are proud Aboriginal people. They fit into normal congregation. They serve on the music roster, you know, beautiful family. We love them, and occasionally Bobby is willing to share his insights um, with us and his knowledge with us. Um, he's got a leadership role um, in the um, transport sector, uh, actually helping Aboriginal people that are employees of state transport. But in our Anglican denomination, Aboriginal congregations are underrepresented. In fact, across the whole Sydney diocese, right, now we're talking about Oh, three or four hundred churches. How many do you think are indigenous led? One? Three. Yes, three is kind of the right answer, but it's, you're in the right ballpark. Um, there are five indigenous led ministries and three churches. Um, and these can be found in Glebe, Redfern, MacArthur, Mount Druitt, and one down in the Shoalhaven area. Now, um, we'll have that next photo, thanks. This um, is the Archbishop hanging out with those um, five Indigenous leaders. Um, lots of smiles all around. 
And it was back in, I think, 2023, maybe 2022, when the, uh, this present Archbishop was installed and he's brought his priorities and he, he identified three key priorities and one of them is the Anglican Church's ministry to Indigenous peoples. Um, and so a couple of uh, just little quotes from the Archbishop. Some of the elders of the Indigenous Christian community, many of whom have served faithfully with very little support for many years, are now reaching an age where they cannot be expected to continue to shoulder the greater part of the work. And you might have heard of these famous aunties and so on, who are wonderful church leaders all around Australia. He goes on, and yet we have a few, we have few in the wings and no pathway which accounts for the demands and the obstacle faced by Indigenous brothers and sisters who seek to serve the Lord in pastoral ministry. We're not very good at training Aboriginal leaders. One of the key, one of the three key areas identified in his statement of purpose and priority for our diocese under his leadership was ministry to First Nations people. And um, there's another photo there which we'll put up for you. I think, oh, maybe, yes, this is a guy called Michael Duckett. Um, uh, he's one of the shining lights and um, he, oh, he's well loved by our uh, Sydney and uh, Illawarra Synod. Um, whenever he stands to speak, everyone smiles before he even opens his mouth. He's a character. And um, he had some interesting things to say about the voice in the debate recently. And he also expressed, as many other Aboriginal leaders have expressed, that that was a particularly difficult time. Uh, for leaders in the Aboriginal community, um, as they are often asked for their opinions and often exposed to a lot of um, diverse and unkind comment. So, um, there's a group in our region led by Brendan Garlett. And if we can go maybe to the next slide, please. Um, so, this is some of the members of this group. Um, it's called Shoalhaven Aboriginal Community Church or Shack for short, and uh, this chap, I um, don't know if he's in that picture, Brendan, who's their uh, leader, trained at Moore College and is relatively new to this congregation, and they currently meet actually between church services it, at now our Anglican church, um, and they're currently working to find a site which would be their own. So the people in this little con community come from extremely broken places, uh, often living around in little communities around Jervis Bay, often with generational family challenges. Uh, one of the functions of the church is to carry out uh, funerals for Aboriginal families and there are way too many and people are dying way too young and it looks sometimes, humanly speaking, like the problems never get solved and it just rolls on and on and it's heartbreaking and the end result is you have these beautiful little groups of believers gathering together but hurting so much. Of course, they don't have a capacity to pay their minister and one of the things that our bishop, uh, Peter Hayward, has asked us to consider is that whether we and the churches of the Illawarra would be willing um, to put some money together um, in order to support Brendan in his ministry down in the Shoalhaven and one of the things the diocese is looking at, working out how they can have some property and a place to call their own. So um, this is an exciting project. There's lots of upside. There's lots of... Um, it's, it's a new thing. And um, in the years ahead, I hope that we see a beautiful thing happening in our Illawarra and Shoalhaven region. So that's actually the first project that I wanted to put in front of you as a congregation. The second uh, project... Uh, that I wanted to put in front of you is much better established and it's up in Darwin and it's a training college for Indigenous leaders. It's called Noongalinya. And um, there's, the, there's the photo of their webpage. Uh, and this is a beautiful ministry, which I've been part of um, supporting for many years. We've got chaps from the Illawarra area heading up there um, right now to serve the college. They've got a new principal, um, it's a new day. And you might have, as you've been in different churches in this church throughout the years, have, you, have we supported Noongalinya in the past? I think, I think, 17 years? Right, okay. So you, some of you already know about Noongalinya College. 
So it's a beautiful thing, you can visit it, um, you can look at the website, it's constantly updated and there's encouraging stories and prayer points coming out. So I encourage you to tap into that. I'm not going to talk a whole lot more uh, except to bring it back to Psalm 89 with a reminder of the faithfulness of God's love. But today I want to call upon you in a different way is to ask the Lord to be faithful to the Aboriginal believers in our land. Um, whether they're well organised and pumping out leaders into Arnhem Land and New Northern Territory and the rest of Australia, or whether they're struggling little communities in regional areas, or whether they're in urban areas that have some kind of ministry and they're shining a light out, uh, we want to be part of the action as a church. And that's why, prayerfully, we want to advocate this as one of our four major focuses in our church for mission. So, love to hear your thoughts, I'm keen to hear your stories and your feedback, but I want to endorse it to you, and um, I'm going to sit down, and as I do so, we're going to watch a video, and this is about three or four minutes, just to hear someone's story who's been through Noongalini College, and just to get, capture perhaps the vision and the heart of this ministry. I come from Millingenby community. That's, that's where I um, was born and bred. But my real country is near Gulf. It's called Ruroi. My life changed when I was about 17 years old. As I was growing up, I used to go to the Sunday school when I was young and I had a baptism service at Millingen Bay community. And that's how I've changed my ways. I had to follow Jesus, because that's when I had found Jesus when I was about 17 years old. And my favorite ways of worshiping God, number one, I like singing. And number two, I like dancing with my worship banner, the way I worship God. How I got interested in coming to Nungalinya for this media course, I um, was interested because I want to learn more of how to take video with my iPad out to set up um, equipment at the church fellowship services and to take video of um, the people in the church or even in my community. The very important ways for me to follow Jesus and why because Jesus is our good shepherd. He leads us to his, uh, his pathway to follow him, to know him fully and to get him as our saviour. 